Today I want to take a look at how to secure a web API using Azure Active Directory. So here we are taking a look at a GitHub account and I've got a controller out here that echoes back the current date and time. Real simple controller and this one's using Windows authentication. It has the authorized decorator and then what you'll notice uh, further up in the solution over here in the web config for the project is that it's authentication mode Windows. So that, that sample is using kind of traditional NTLM or Kerberos with the, the Windows login handshake. What I would like to do is create one of these that uses Azure Active Directory and uses Office 365's kind of tokens that are in the background so we can protect an API that we're calling from some sort of front end development on Office 365. That might be SPFX, it could be a content editor, it could be a JavaScript custom action, some front end development in 365 needs to talk to a custom API hosted, that web API can host it either on-prem or in Azure, but we need to be able to give it a token and it has to be done with Azure Active Directory. We're not going to use any domain membership implied authentication through IIS. So to get that started, we come over here to portal.azure.com and we look up the enterprise applications and we go ahead and click new application that you are developing. So here we can see the list of app registrations for our owned applications, things we've custom developed, and a menu option for new. So if we go ahead and click new, uh, we have a couple different options. We'll do this one for single tenant directory only. Uh, this can be you know, extended to include personal Microsoft accounts, maybe multi-tenant. This is kind of your B2B scenario where you have a trust with another tenant. Uh, but we're going to go ahead and choose the single, and we'll put a name in the top here. And we'll just call it Hello World. Nice and easy. Register a new application, and that gives us a couple of interesting GUID numbers. We have the tenant GUID number, which is inherited from the Azure Active Directory instance we're working on, but we also have an application ID number. That'll become important later. So let's go ahead and copy that to clipboard, and we will paste it over in Notepad. Okay, cool. Now if we go into Quick Start, this is really handy and this is where all the good stuff happens. You have a lot of different platforms and languages to pick from. We are going to choose ASP.NET full-sized and that will give us the ability to make a web API. When you go into the Quick Start, there's a slick diagram here that explains the authentication handshake. That when you open the ASP.NET web app, it will redirect you, prompt for credentials, get a token from the Microsoft Identity Platform, and then bring that token back in so that we have it available for signing our API calls. We can't do HTTP anonymous and do zero headers and expect things to work. We have to pass the token over. There's HTTP headers and cookies that go with doing that. So first things first, uh, it actually is intelligent enough to say you haven't done something with your app registration. You need to provide a reply URL such as localhost 44368. Sounds like a good number to me. We'll click make update. So what that did was it actually updated our app registration object in Azure. Pretty cool. Next, we go ahead and download the VS Code solution, zip. And opening the solution in Visual Studio, we see a controllers folder, which is where our web API endpoints will live. And if we go back over to our instructions, we need to configure the project. We're going to extract it, open the SLN file, which we've already done. And after that, we're going to do restore NuGet packages. So at the root solution, we'll do a right click, restore NuGet packages. That will go ahead and download a bunch of stuff that we need for the project to work. And one thing you'll notice while that's running is that a lot of these yellow icons for your assembly references, things that are not found, will then repaint and appear with uh, solid icons. So we'll go ahead and let the package manager run. We'll do a build operation. And now what we see is build succeeded and all of the icons are black and white. No more yellow warnings. Pretty cool. So NuGet, the restore NuGet packages downloads a lot of dependencies. Then we have a special step to update a package for the .NET compiler platform R. That's kind of Interesting. We'll go ahead and run it and then do another build. 
just to make sure that build succeeded. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. And then they want us to edit the web config to put a client ID and a tenant ID. So we'll come on down here to web config. We do have a placeholder for client and tenant. Those are not the, yes, those are the correct values. So these are specific to our application. And they were really, you know, generated by this quick start that's already logged in to our instance. This quick start account supports accounts and guests of this directory only. So the local one. Uh, down here is a lot of technical detail about how all the pieces work together. But for the most part, we're kind of up and running here. So we want to do right click on controllers and we're going to add a new item. We will do, hmm, actually, let's do add controller. We'll do a web API to controller empty. We'll name it hello controller. And then it's going to open up a few dependencies. Cool. We'll go check out the code itself. Right, good. And in here, I want to add a get method which enumerates the current date and time. And I'm also going to add a little something extra. I'm going to decorate the class with an authorize method for security and enable cores for cross-origin resource sharing. Now that's a NuGet package that is not part of this particular template that did not come from Microsoft, but it's one that I like to have because then you can host this API on Azure and call it from Office 365 and the domain names and headers are different. So we're going to install Microsoft ASP.NET Web API cores. Uh, actually, that's going to be install package. I had a typo here. Install package. Microsoft ASP.NET Web API cores. Okay, and with that package installed, we can right click on enable cores and include using system web HTTP cores. Uh, yep, there we go. And we got some using statements that are not active up there, but that's fine. Go ahead and build. We got our authorized decorator, enable cores decorator, cool stuff. And our packages file has a whole bunch going on, including the ASP.NET Web API cores. So we're up and running, we got our application registered. Let's go ahead and do one other thing. The port number for this from our web registration was 44368. All right, cool. Go ahead and hit F5 and we'll allow the certificate. four four three six eight HTTPS so here we are running the project we have a giant sign in with Microsoft button which performs a authentication flow up here it's going to pop up and say like to access your basic profile and maintain access to the data you have given it access to and here's a fun one consent on behalf of the whole organization so if you do this last one, then nobody else will get the permission pop-up. So we click the sign in button. It says, hello, Jeff Jones. Pretty cool. We do see your claims. We see our username. We see our tenant ID. Got all of this rich detail about our login tokens. We are actually logged in to the system. So here we want to go ahead and remove the CTX and current user context variables. We'll do a build solution and we're going to double check some of our load dependencies that we have a method for global configuration, which is application start over here. And we want to make sure that we've got area registration, web API registration and route config. And the global will go to definition. We want to make sure that's defined here. Sure is. There's a, a using statement that helps with that. But by having all three of these registrations in the global, then our project's in a better position to successfully route APIs. Because the controllers we have here 
are not API controllers. This is the first API controller, so we need to make sure that global is properly set with those dependencies. If we go ahead and build the project and run, then what we can do is step through a test. So we can go ahead and go over here and we can open up localhost. <laughs> so now with our project up and running, we can click sign in with Microsoft. We see our username. We can enumerate our claims to see all this rich detail about who we're logged in as. And if we open API slash hello, this will be our API controller echoing back the date and time. And it has all of the cookies and tokens and headers in the background. If we were to invoke that same URL from Fiddler, which doesn't have any to tokens, it'll come back and have a series of uh, redirect to the login. And here we can see that we have our endpoint returning a 302 request with a redirect. So that is HTTP 302 found. The location is login.microsoft and authorization denied. Because we open the API in Fiddler, which has no tokens and no headers and no context, it's just an anonymous HTTP get. It's saying denied, you need to go log in first. But when we open it in our browser, which has been authenticated, we're able to see all of our rich data coming back from our API. So this is how we can secure web APIs using Azure Active Directory. Thanks for watching.